Well, parents and guests and colleagues and friends, we're delighted that you have been able to join us for this afternoon's celebration of God's faithfulness in the lives of our graduates. I'm Dr. Cal McFarland, and I'm standing in for uh, Dr. Taylor this afternoon. He's a little under the weather and couldn't join us. Before we begin, let me invite you to make sure that uh, all the electronic devices are turned off. And in a moment, our graduates will enter and take their places on the platform. So just please take your seats and remain seated for their processional. And once they're in place, we'll pause the program briefly for you to take pictures of the graduating class on the platform. Thanks, we'll see you in a minute or two.
You may be seated. Welcome to our campus. We're delighted to have you join us for this celebration, and I know we're all so grateful uh, to be, other, be able to gather like this live and in person. Now, along with the Canadian and provincial flags, we're also displaying the Treaty 4 flag, representing the 1874 treaty between the Cree and Soto First Nations and Queen Victoria. Uh, we do this to remind us all that we are a treaty people and want to support and affirm our Indigenous students who study and live in our community. As we begin this celebration today, please uh, rise for the singing of Canada, which will be followed by Dr. Carl Hinderager uh, reading God's Word and Dr. Margaret Clark leading us in prayer. And gentlemen, as a sign of respect, I would invite you to remove your caps and leave them off until the presentation of the graduates. And let's face the flag as we sing. to read a portion of scripture uh, for all of us, but especially to our grads. Uh, Paul commissioned Timothy, a younger man at a crucial time in his life, to stay away from people who claim to be Christians but don't live a holy life, and to remain faithful by continually applying scripture to his own life, and to keep pointing people back to scripture instead of their own ideas. First Tim uh, Second Timothy chapter 3. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times, for people will only love themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They'll betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They'll act religious, but they'll reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. You must remain faithful to the things you've been taught. You know they're true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they've given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes from trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. So I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you, 
should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Let's pray. Dear Father God, thank you for this day when we can gather together as a school to celebrate our graduates. We're grateful for the role you've entrusted to Briarcrest in educating disciples. Today, we give thanks for the fruition of the hard work of our students and also acknowledge our faculty and staff for their contributions to these students. We're grateful to you for the friends and family who have supported these graduates along their educational journey and have granted them and gathered here to celebrate with them. Please bless them. We pray that these, as these students have been further equipped to serve the church and engage the world, that you will guide them and bless them vocationally. Guide each graduate toward the opportunities you have ahead for them. Grant each graduate your favor and blessing. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Today, our graduates become alumni, and we're so grateful for the ongoing partnership that we enjoy with our alumni. And at this time, I would like to introduce to you this year's Alumni of the Year. Cairnport is where everything started for Dale and Patty Bergren. Dale grew up as a port kid and attended elementary and high school on campus. Patty attended Cairnport High School, and they were high school sweethearts who were married in 1973. At present, Dale and Patty uh, live in Regina, and they have three children, and they've been blessed with 10 grandchildren, one of whom is in heaven. Dale was full-time campus electrician from 1977 to 1989 when they scaled back uh, to part-time through the 1990s while getting involved in several other businesses. And when Patty started working in 1989, as she planned to work for only a couple of years while Dale attended SIAST, but in the end she spent 15 years in various office roles until 2005 when they moved to Regina. Dale's entrepreneurial spirit motivated him to get involved with several businesses, including Synergy Electric Corporation, which he co-founded in 2001 and served as president until his retirement in 2019. Dale and Patty were introduced to Leader Impact, a ministry of power to change in 2016. Leader Impact seeks to train and equip leaders in their personal, professional, and spiritual development. In 2016, the two of them were invited to Panama to participate in the ministry's first global exchange, an international leaders development conference. And since then, they've visited Guatemala, Romania, and the Philippines on these outreach ministries, and they were telling us about them last night. They do sound fascinating and engaging. Uh, Dale has continued to uh, be involved through Zoom, meeting virtually with leader impact groups based uh, in Paraguay and Guatemala. Dale and Patty attend Harvest City Church in Regina, and they have been blessed to go on several mission trips with their church to Uganda. They serve in various areas of the church, including a weekly leaders group uh, called a Life Group. Dale and Patty, come, let us honor you, and then we'll invite you, Dale, to say a few words to encourage and give counsel to our students. Come on up, Dale and Patty. Of course, I lose my notes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why it's not coming up here. And I can't do it from memory, so I may have to reboot my phone. Maybe I will go from, from memory. 
Thank you, President Polkey, for and your committee for inviting us to accept this honour, and we just truly are grateful. And uh, it, it uh, for for many many years, I've worked behind the scenes here, and to be up front here is uh, somewhat uncomfortable, to say the least. Um, what I would like to share a little bit about is that. Uh, I was a lifer here at Cairnport. Uh, I first set foot on the campus, at this campus here, in 1951. And if to do the math, that's 71 years ago. I was nine months old at that time. My parents, <laughs> <laughs> and we have not missed a year being on the campus ever since. That, uh, seems quite incredible for all these years that, uh, that we've been here, but what a pleasure it has been to, to work here at the college, get to know people and the staff. And uh, I was asked to share what some of the alumni that have impacted my life. And obviously the first one is my wife of uh, 49 years. We met in uh, high school here and were married in 1973. And uh, so that is a very significant alumnus to me. <laughs> As you think about all the alumni that I've known over the years, which are thousands, um, but one came to mind that I think probably impacted me the most uh, were my mom and dad. Mom and dad graduated, or my dad didn't graduate, he got sick, but they were here in 39 and 40. And dad has always been a tremendous encourager to me. My dad was a businessman. Uh, he was the first business manager, I don't know what you'd call him now, a CEO of, uh, of Briarcrest. And dad always had farmland while I was growing up, and I got to spend a lot of time with my dad. And he taught me more of the business principles that I know and spiritual principles uh, that have followed me through my life. And when there's times and situations come up, I, I reflect on what my dad had, had taught me. He had a tough love. I recall uh, one of the first little business enterprises I went into. Uh, I bought some equipment and it broke down and I went to dad for sympathy. And he looked at me and he says, boy, if you can't stand the heat, don't stand by the fire. <laughs> so I knew I had to buck up and uh, take it on my own. So, so dad was just tremendous. My uh, siblings, obviously, my si oldest sister is here today, and thank you for coming. And uh, my brother-in-law, uh, both alumni of Briarcrest, and again, the help and the guidance and encouragement they've been to us has uh, been incredible. Let's see if I get my notes up now. I'd like to say congratulations to each of you grads today. It's an amazing step that you've gone to and you're stepping into a new phase of your life, summer continuing education. It was a joy to be at your program last night. Uh, it brought back lots of memories of when we were here and sat through many of these uh, ceremonies. So congratulations and welcome to the Alumni Association. Yeah, other significant alumni in my life, uh, especially growing up as a kid here, uh, obviously we had teachers. Uh, we, Patty and I both just attended high school. Yeah, but uh, the teachers were very instrumental. But because of growing up as a kid and watching the teachers and the different staff, it's the behind the scenes staff played a tremendous role in being role models to me is how to live and dedicate yourself to something. So uh, they were significant alumni to me as well. The other thing is Patty's class of 1970 uh, has been a class that has kept in communication with each other for, I forget how many years there was a class letter. We did have a 50th uh, uh, celebration here a few years ago. We unfortunately were away and didn't think we were in Africa at the time, didn't get to it. But that class 
There's been, uh, several individuals in that class that we've kept in touch with that have been an encouragement. I think for myself, uh, there's three, two or three of the guys that we hung out together. We probably got into some trouble together here. And uh, we met, I think it was in 2016 in Vancouver, Patty's, the girls had a reunion. I was with two of the other fellas and the trouble that we'd got into, but when we got together and found that we were all following the Lord and we sat down and had a prayer time together, it was just incredible. Those are significant alumni in my life. Getting involved in Leader Impact has changed my life. It uh, got me dealing with other business people. Uh, we have weekly meetings and we study a book, a business book, and we discuss the business principles and it helps to, uh, to navigate through some of life's issues. And as business leaders, it's not easy to find somebody to talk to and to share your problems because you're looked up to as a leader, you, you seem to be, get put on a pedestal. And so creating these groups is a way for people to, or business leaders to, to share with one another the things that are going on in their lives and to, uh, to share what the relevance of our faith in Jesus is in our business and in our uh, professional and our personal lives. And it is very relevant. We try to keep about three quarters of the members in the group, uh, and usually around 10 to 12 people. Uh, about three quarters of them are Christians and try and keep a quarter of them non-Christians because that is our mandate is to go out and share the gospel with those around us. And if you can reach a leader, you can start to reach a community. I wanna share uh, just four things here really quickly with the grads and to you as well. Uh, being a businessman, I've learned a lot of things through life. And what I want to caution you on as you go through, I mean, this is a day of celebration. I'm going to just caution you on a few things uh, that I've learned in my life over and over and over is that don't believe that everything you think in your mind is true. And why I say that, I have deceived myself many, many times. I've prayed about things and I think the Lord has told me this is it. And I've gone to a meetings and before I go in, the Holy Spirit has touched my mind and says, Dale, you're way off track here. So just be careful, be cautious. And surround yourself with some good, solid people to mentor you, not necessarily in your group. Get somebody that can take the view from outside. Because if you're in a rut, you need somebody that's outside the rut to see what's going on. So just be careful that you don't believe everything that you think is true. The next thing, unfortunately, what's going to happen in life is that you're going to make some mistakes. And I trained all of my leaders in our electrical company, this guy's, it's not if you're going to make a mistake, it's when you make a mistake, it's how do you recover. And I found the best advice is the first thing you do is you accept the responsibility of the mistake. You own it, even if it wasn't your fault. And the other thing is that you choose how you're going to respond to it. And there's another place when you run into that situation. It is good to have some mentors behind you, somebody that you can reach out to, some godly counsel to, to walk you through that. Third thing is, you've all learned a lot of things, so you've learned a lot of, of your uh, skills and what your strengths are. And it's important to know your strengths and to develop them. But you know what I found more important? Is know your weaknesses. I listened to a podcast yesterday morning, and the fellow speaking said that, uh, become a student of yourself know yourself and again get wise counsel to help people pull out of you because again you can deceive yourself once you do that i've mentioned a few times get counsel around you i also had another saying i used to my uh, workers and leaders in my company is when you go through these things know who to call 
So start a list of people, build some relationships with people. And obviously God is the first <clears throat> to call. But know who to call and don't try to go through it yourself. Anyway, I want to say thank you for this opportunity. You are heading out now and uh, scripture commands us to go out and preach the gospel to all the people. The other thing is that when you do that, remember the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. I can leave you one statement. I thought it was good. Again, came from that same podcast yesterday, and it's from Mark Twain. It's not from the Bible. Good judgment is the result of experience. Experience is the result of bad judgment. <laughs> Fail, failure is an opportunity to learn, so go out and learn well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dale and Patty. For more than 50 years, Dr. Paul Magnus has served Briarcrest in many different capacities. Dr. Magnus uh, has served as president from 1996 to 2004, along with almost every imaginable job in this institution. During this time, Dr. Magnus has influenced the field of leadership and management in Canada through his teaching, consulting, and networking efforts. He has served energetically in the classroom, Boardrooms, local churches, and cohorts of leadership students gathered in locations across the country and certainly beyond. His passion has been to train a generation of great and godly leaders by inspiring them to expand their capacity, confidence, and competency for service as they serve God in their varied callings. Dr. Magnus has uh, been a driving force behind the development of our Masters of Arts in Leadership and Management program here, which has alumni scattered across the globe. And in honor of his contributions to the field of leadership and service at Briarcrest, the Paul E. Magnus Center for Leadership and Management Studies has been established with Ellen Duffield as alumna of the Malm program and as its coordinator. The center aims to strengthen leaders' training, leadership training in Canada at all levels, resourcing Christian leaders for influence in the church, nonprofit, corporate, and public sectors. And uh, earlier today, a number of uh, graduates and alumni of the program gathered together to wish uh, Dr. Magnus well in his retirement, sort of retirement. And uh, so many of us attest uh, with great appreciation for his work uh, prior to coming to this role. I uh, served a, a church for 19 years and about the 10 year mark, I was feeling a little bit flat and I gave Dr. Magnus a call for some coaching, uh, which he happily uh, entered in, into my life for a season. And that story has been replicated over and over and over again. And so Paul and Jane, we'd like to honor you today. Come on up and let us uh, have a little bit of time of reflecting upon your over 50 years of leadership. Jane, come on up. We'd like to direct your attention to the screen above for a tribute video. As I think about one word that is descriptive of what I think is essential for leadership, enabled. Let me explain why I chose that, enabled. I was enabled by people 
to believe enough in myself that I was willing to try. We talk so much about accountability, holding people accountable. I think what we haven't done well is hold people able. And I believe that I was always enabled. It's over 60 years ago that I came to Cairnport High School. I did Briarcrest Bible College eventually and later I also did some seminary courses even though I already had a doctoral degree. I still did some seminary courses just to say I had studied in all the schools. That's the kind of person I am, you know. I like to finish it out. And in my time at the University of Saskatchewan, the summer after my second year there, Henry Budd, who had taught me in my final year of college, was in the community. He saw potential in me there and he segued me into Briarcrest. Within six months, I formed a registrar admission office combination. Henry Budd invited me to become the dean of the faculty. And eventually, after serving in multiple roles, became provost and senior vice president. For a season, I was executive vice president. Continuously, people would see potential and say, we think you are the next in line. The board came and wanted me to be president. I said, what makes you think that I should do this? They said, well, we think you have what we need right now. Courageous leadership sees potential in people and seeks to grow that influence and impacting people to grow their potential. And that's been my experience at Briarcrest. So leadership and teaching were a combination true for all of my years at Briarcrest. I loved that because I was always teaching what I was doing. People sometimes assume that leading is much simpler than it is. And the assumption that, oh, well, anybody can lead. I think anyone can influence people to move a little. But leading an enterprise is categorically different. And I always tell people who say, well, anyone can lead. I just say, lead what? That's the key, lead what? So I would say the biggest challenge around my own thinking, it started within me, then it was hearing the voices of others, etc. And for me, I would sit back and reflect and learn. My approach to leading was, I wanted to learn slightly ahead of what was required. <laughs> so if I could anticipate what was coming, I'd be all over the learning of it. And then I wouldn't be fighting my own assumptions about too much or too little capacity or the assumptions of others. I would have been leaning into the learning so I could lean into the doing. Well, I want to challenge you to dream, but I also want to roll it out a little, little differently. Dream and be courageous in bringing the dream to life. It will take courage and it will take intentionality, but make sure you do that by first consulting with God. What would he long for you to be and do? I'd just like to leave that with you. Dr. Jay Machenko first joined the faculty at Briarcrest Seminary in 2020. He took on the coordination of the Master of Arts in Leadership and Management program and implementation of grant funds generously awarded by the Lilly Endowment. Dr. Machenko and Ellen Duffield, coordinator of the Paul E. Magnus Center for Leadership Studies, have collaborated to use those funds in mobilizing the multivocational ministry project. It's a network that's designed to support multivocational ministers across Canada. 
Briarcrest Seminary is exceedingly grateful for the expertise and enthusiasm Dr. Machenko brings to the table and are thrilled to have him installed as the Paul E. Magnus Chair of Leadership and Management Studies. Please come forward. Thank you so much. Briarcrest's continuing vision is to educate disciples, equip the church, and engage our world. And so our partnership with the church is absolutely vital in our kingdom mission. Today I'm pleased to introduce our commencement speaker, a pastor of one of, his, one of Canada's leading churches, Marvin Voida. He's lived his entire life here in the prairies. He began his ministry in 1979 and followed, following several significant ministries, began serving at Elam Church in Saskatoon in 1990 and continues to this day. Now that is telling you something right there. Marvin is a graduate of our seminary's mom program and has served in PAOC denominational leadership as well as boards of Wycliffe Canada and One Book. Marvin is married to Charlene and they have three adult daughters, four grandchildren, and I want to welcome Marvin. Come join us and uh, we're looking forward to your charge to all of us today. Marvin. Chairman Weens, Chancellor Barkman, President Pavelke, President Emeritus Magnus, provincial and community leaders, faculty, honored guests, parents and friends, esteemed graduates. It's a privilege to address you today and especially a privilege for me as I begin this afternoon. I want to especially acknowledge and thank Dr. Paul Magnus as we celebrate his 50 years with Briarcrest, we, my wife and I, count Dr. and Mrs. Magnus as dear friends. It was actually through a conversation about 18 years ago that I decided to pursue a seminary education here at Briarcrest, and I didn't know at the time what a profound influence Dr. Magnus would have on my life and leadership, and so congratulations, dear friends. The passage that I have chosen is from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. The Apostle Paul writes this. He says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. It was 10 years ago today that I sat on this platform and I was waiting for my name to be called. It was a day that marked accomplishment. It was a day that marked hard work. My heart was full, my brain was a little weary, but I felt more equipped and prepared to move forward to lead and minister and serve uh, with greater confidence and greater competence and greater energy. My ministry toolbox was much fuller uh, that day than it had been when I had entered. 
At the time of graduation, I had been at uh, Elam Church in Saskatoon for 22 years. And three weeks before I graduated, we moved into an, a new ministry facility. And with those two big projects behind me, I could now focus my energies fully on the new opportunities that a new ministry facility would afford us. And by God's grace, in the next few years, we experienced levels of growth not seen in the 100-plus uh, years of ministry that Elam has had in the city. And then came March 2020. How many of you remember March 2020? We got word on a Tuesday that weekend services would be canceled, and like many others, life became a whirlwind of Zoom meetings and crisis management, Travel plans were canceled. Your president contacted me uh, to let me know that the graduation I was supposed to speak to was canceled. The world changed. And I hearken back to our seminary classes where Dr. Magnus introduced us to the acronym VUCA to describe the world that we were living in. VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And for so many of us in the last two years, we've been experiencing VUCA on steroids. The world has changed. The world that you are graduating into is a different one than when you enrolled here at Briarcrest. My world changed. The world of church and ministry looks and feels di quite different than it did two years ago. And Besides some very functional and practical kinds of changes that are obvious, there is there's much more that is so nuanced and subtle that has changed as well. And with many of the changes, we have yet to realize the long-term effects of the pandemic on churches and on church life. I think we are all aware of the profound and growing distrust of established institutions. And that spills over, of course, into how society views the church and what were cracks in our culture before this are now, in many cases, these deep divides. And it is precisely for this VUCA world that you have been prepared. As so much is shifting within the culture, you have been trained in and steeped in the eternal, never-changing Word of God. That's your superpower as you walk into this next season. When the invitation to speak here today was graciously extended again, my immediate thought was of the passage that I read a few moments ago from 1 Timothy. Timothy is facing some challenges when Paul writes that he had urged Timothy to stay there in Ephesus, it's clear that Timothy had been, he'd been looking for a way out. For Paul to have to urge him to stay means that there had been some conversations. Timothy had not hidden his desire to, to move on. Uh, the cliche that pastors have an undated letter of resignation in the top drawer of their desk isn't too far off. There are pressures and disappointments and challenges that will cause you to question whether or not it is worth it to stay put in the difficult environments that you will find yourself in. I want you to notice in Paul's words, it wasn't a message where he was saying, well, you know, hang in there, kid, it's going to get better. Paul reminds Timothy that there was a compelling reason for him to dig in and stay in Ephesus. The reason for Timothy to stay trumped, whatever his reasons may have been for wanting to, to leave that environment. Just a quick but I think important note, at this point, Timothy had known Paul for more than a decade. He had been at Paul's side for extended periods in, the, in, that, uh, in, those, in those 10 years. He was, he was Paul's scribe, and together they had, they had written 2 Corinthians and Philippians and 1 Thessalonians, Philemon, and possibly some other letters. To say that Timothy had been trained and mentored and coached by the best would, of course, be an understatement. What had he learned from Paul that would provide the reason to press on in the face of challenge? Well, you don't need to be a scholar of, of Pauline literature to know that Paul was centered on and focused on Jesus. 
Having recently preached through Philippians again, I, I was impressed by the clear sense for Paul of the centrality of Jesus for life and for ministry. Knowing him, loving him, becoming more like him, anticipating his coming. And evidently there were some in Ephesus who were teaching false doctrines. I have to assume that their false doctrines were, were rooted in an erroneous view or understanding of Jesus. Confronting their view of Jesus was a compelling reason for him to stay put. And then Paul refers to those who devote themselves to myths and endless genealogy. And of course, this afternoon is not a time to go into the specifics of those myths and genealogies, but it's clear that they are in a different category than false doctrines. Myths would be in the category of all of the things that people can debate and divide over, and Paul calls them here myths that promote controversial speculation. In a very real sense, he was charging Timothy to stay on in order to demonstrate what it is to keep the main thing the main thing, to not get sidetracked or distracted by secondary issues. I can tell you that in the over 40 plus years of pastoral ministry, I have watched so many myths come and go, so many issues where people wanted me to embrace one side or the other. In the last two years, I, I along with uh, probably every pastor in, in, who's gone through this pandemic, we have watched the polarization and division of, over so many issues, and the pressure has been on for me to publicly take sides and get on somebody's bandwagon, promote some controversial speculation. And as we're navigating leadership in the midst of significant pressure, I was reminded from this passage that our call in Christian leadership is to keep Jesus central. And I was urged to remain on in order to do that. Our key task is to keep leading in ways that bring people back together to the one central focus of Jesus, knowing him, loving him, serving him, becoming more and more like him. A few months ago, I received an email from a very frustrated person in our church frustrated that I wouldn't promote her position around vaccines and government mandates. And in her frustration that I wouldn't promote her ideas, she let me know that she wasn't happy with the fact that with all that is going on in the world, that I, her pastor, was persisting in just preaching from the Bible. And as I read that, I thought, guilty as charged. <laughs> we cannot. We must not allow our focus to be diverted from the main thing. In the final step before I graduated from Briarcrest Seminary, I had one final exam, and back then it was called the oral exam. And in the room that day was the dean of the seminary, and Dr. Magnus was in the room. And I had come to that room prepared to answer questions about organizational leadership. That was, after all, my major. And I can't recall if it was the first question I was asked by the dean, but it was certainly close to the beginning. And his question to me was, Marvin, what do you think about Jesus? Honestly, I thought, what an odd question. <laughs> but he was making the point that after all of my reading and studying and learning about leadership and management and how to lead and manage an organization, this seminary wanted students to graduate with a clear eye on Jesus as revealed in the scriptures. So graduates, graduates, as you move forward in this VUCA world, when the going gets difficult, I want to urge you to keep on, remain on. Over your time at Briarcrest, you have been shaped by the scriptures, you have been formed as disciples, your eyes have been on Jesus, and you have deepened your understanding of him as you have sought the scriptures and sought him in prayer. You may not fully understand today how to navigate the VUCA environment. With Paul's words to Timothy, I urge you to keep the main thing the main thing. Know him and live for and focus on Jesus and on making him known. And I want to leave you with verse 5. Paul writes this, The goal of this command is love 
which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Well, this afternoon, it's my joy to introduce you to Emily Pinter, the college valedictorian for the 2022 graduating class. And as Emily comes forward, let me just tell you just a little bit about her. Emily came to Briarcrest in 2019 as a transfer student and moved her major from animal science to English. As her bio states, Briarcrest College offered a place to explore the intersection of her love of literature and devotion to her Christian faith. And I've personally witnessed both as they've come together. Uh, we, her professors, have been deeply encouraged by her diligence and commitment. Her efforts have offered her, uh, earned her a scholarship to graduate studies at Queen's University Kingston this coming fall. And we are confident that she will continue uh, to excel there as here. Emily has demonstrated herself to be a respected and valuable member of our college community, a gifted and diligent student who graduates today with an honors degree in English and a cumulative GPA of 4.0. So Emily, it is with great pleasure on behalf of Briarcrest College that I present you with the honor of College Valedictorian 2022. Congratulations to you and to the class which you represent. Come and share your address. Thank you, Cal. Good afternoon, family, friends, and honored guests. On behalf of the graduating class of 2022, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for being here today and joining our celebration. Considering the fact that we have not joined together to celebrate a normal in-person graduation ceremony in two years, it is especially meaningful to have all of you here with us today. Thanks be to God. First, I want to take this moment to especially thank our professors and our faculty. Thank you for supporting us and giving us the tools we needed to be up on this stage. Especially these past two years, you've served us so well, physically, spiritually, and mentally during a time of constant change, disorder, and significant strain. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. I would also, on behalf of the class, like to thank our RDs, coaches, parents, friends, priests, pastors, and leaders for using your gifts to enrich our lives at Briarcrest and lead us in Christian leadership and discipleship. Your intentional relational investment in our lives does not go unnoticed. Finally, fellow graduates, congratulations. We've worked hard and grown significantly in the years leading to this moment. By the grace of Jesus and the gift of many cups of coffee, we will soon be Briarcrest graduates. I can imagine that many of you are feeling mixed emotions as I am about ending our Briarcrest journey together. But I would encourage you, whatever place you find yourself today, try and find some space to consider and process this moment. I do not think that it is remiss of me to say that we've gone through many unexpected things together at Briarcrest, especially these past two years as we've ridden the COVID wave that life has thrown at us. However, I still see and want to recognize the immense development that we have experienced. Through the grace of God, our community has led us to grow spiritually as we have worshiped, prayed, and studied God's word together. We have had relationships blossom that we may have for the rest of our lives. Through the hard work of our professors, we have learned some things, hopefully, <laughs> and might carry some new perspectives that we did not have two or three years ago. I know that I cannot speak to everyone's personal experiences at Briarcrest, but I can say with confidence that all of us have been transformed in a way that is meaningful for us. As I was reflecting on what message I should leave with all of you today, I realized that I did not want to follow the two most common paths that valedictorian speeches usually tread. Number one, the focus on our past experience, sitting neck deep in nostalgia and dwelling on how hard it will be to leave this place that we have called home for three, four years. Or on the opposite side of the spectrum, two, the overemphasis on the bright future awaiting us and the potential we carry into our impending, quote, real lives while waving a hurry goodbye to our past reality. 
I do not, do not want to say that these thoughts are somehow wrong or without merit. But instead, I would like to center this part of my address around a section of a poem by R.S. Thomas, which is called The Bright Field. It reads as follows. Quote, life is not hurrying on to a receding future, nor hankering after an imagined past. It is the turning aside, like Moses, to the miracle of the lit bush, to a brightness that seemed as transitory as your youth once, but it is the eternity that awaits you, end quote. Instead of clinging on to the past or desperately running towards the future, I want to give you this truth. Let us celebrate and see the work of the Spirit in this present moment. I will be the first to admit that living in the present has never been a strength of mine. Like many human beings, I either romanticize the past or the future without seeing my life as it is now. However, I have been thinking lately on what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 15 to 16. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. This prompts the question, what is the Spirit calling me to in my present life? And most importantly, will I say yes to that call? I do not believe that the best of life or our spiritual journeys are behind us as we leave Briarcrest. However, I equally do not want to affirm that our time here has merely been a stepping stone or a season that one must jump over to reach the blessings that God really has for us in the future. I would like to suggest a posture of wonder or amazement in acknowledging the present moment that God places us into. Or, in other words, ask yourself something that my wise father tells me many times. Where are the fingerprints of the Spirit in my life right now? Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. Consider what God is calling you to say yes to in your life right now. One of my favorite podcasters slash writers, who I actually discovered in the middle of pandemic lockdown, writes this in her book called Aggressively Happy, A Realist's Guide to Believing in the Goodness of Life. Quote, begin the song exactly where you are. Try not to predict the future or litigate the past. Do not wish you were someone else. Accept the fullness and emptiness of your life. God's voice is quiet. Listen to the soft, low hum of your life. There is a song there, and only in the quietness will you learn to sing it. Say yes to your life. The song will come in time." End quote. Graduating class of 2022, my brothers and sisters, I encourage you to see the hope in the life that God gives you at this time. And if it is hard for you to say yes to your life, may the Spirit lead you to hope. I will conclude by reading from Romans 15:13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you.
Courtney Wee partners with her husband, Mike, to serve in pastoral ministry at the Strathmore Alliance Church in Strathmore, Alberta. She entered the Master of Arts in Marriage and Family Therapy program to better equip herself to serve their church and their community. Her diligent and thoughtful engagement with her studies and her commitment to spiritual and intellectual formation for a life of service helps make her a perfect candidate to represent the Briarcrest Seminary graduating class of 2022. We're very glad to introduce her as your 2022 valedictorian. Courtney, please come and share your address with us. Thank you for that incredibly kind introduction. Hello to the friends and family of today's graduates, the faculty and staff at Briarcrest, and my fellow grads. I am equally honored and terrified to give the seminary valedictorian address today. I must start by saying that I genuinely have no idea how this happened. I. <laughs> I recognize that good grades got me into consideration, but truth be told, some 14 years ago, when I graduated from here with a bachelor's degree, I was certain I was not coming back. Born and raised in the lush green and mild temperatures of British Columbia, um, I didn't think a good God would ask me to come back to a place where <laughs> little tearsicles would freeze on my cheeks walking from my dorm to my class. But like so many times before, I was wrong. A good God did indeed call me back to the prairies to live and serve in ministry in Alberta. And then three years ago, I was just going to take a couple of classes to help me and my husband in pastoral ministry. And somehow, by the grace of God and his provision, I am standing before you, graduating as a marriage and family therapist. Now that's just a snippet of my story the one that the God of the universe has penned over my soul. He knows the steps I will take before I take them. He knows moments like this where success seems inevitable and the times when my heart will break over failure. We all have a story, a narrative that defines and describes our life, and it ebbs and flows with blessing and suffering. This should not surprise us as Christians. We are, after all, a people of story the grand narrative of Scripture being chief among them all. Our stories direct and define our lives, and for us graduates, this is a benchmark moment in our personal narratives. It's the end of a chapter of education at Briarcrest and the beginning of a new one of career or further education at a different institution. But one of the things that I've learned in my time studying psychotherapy here at Briarcrest 
is that our stories are not siloed. We exist in a system that we impact and that impacts us. Our divine design is one of relationship, relationship with our maker and relationship with humanity, our family, our friends, our communities. As a therapist, I've had the privilege of sitting with people as they share their stories, agonizing over the trauma and pain that has been inflicted on them through the words and hands of other people. But for all the pain they can cause, there is no other restoring agent as ripe with healing potential as relationships. Sometimes it's with me as their therapist, and sometimes it's with people within their circle of communi community. Relationships are often what hurt us, but they are also what heals us. For us graduates, neither are we siloed in our stories. The legacy of Briarcrest has been invested to us and woven into our narrative. We have become a part of this place, and it has become a part of us. It has also been relationships that have sustained us as we have done this graduate work. Therefore, today's victory belongs as much to those supportive family and friends as it does to us. For me, that's my amazing husband and four beautiful children. I cannot tell you how many times my husband picked up the slack so that I could work on an assignment, or the times when my kids would comfort me with cuddles and encouragement and homemade cards and let me know how proud they were. As a parent, it makes my heart glad to see how my educational journey has impacted their story. They have seen failure and submission to God's will. They have seen perseverance and action. They have seen a striving for balance between responsibilities with the highest priority on the relationship between myself and my maker. They know that I am their mother, but not only a mother. They know that I am a pastor's wife, but my name is actually not the pastor's wife. I hope that when my children look back on this part of their story, they see the unity of our family, and they know that we did this together. Our little family system, as imperfect as it may be, is the reason for and the reason I could reach this goal today. Graduates, regardless of what your life circumstances are, and how you managed to reach this goal today. You are part of your own system, your own network of friends, family, church, and community. Do not neglect the opportunity to thank those who stood with you, beside you, and behind you to help you reach this goal today. I was explaining to my kids what a valedictorian was, especially to one of my eight-year-old sons who asks a lot of questions. Um, I must have done a poor job articulating its definition because he responded with, Oh, so it's like you won. <laughs> and I responded with, no, sweet boy, I did not win. I could not have won because we fellow graduates have never been in competition. Rather, we have stood shoulder to shoulder and supported each other, encouraged each other, challenged each other on this journey. There have been times when we laugh together, and I can attest to crying together, and reminding each other to read the whole syllabus before emailing our professor. <laughs> we have not been competing for this honor, but it is because of your friendship that I have been blessed with it today. So thank you for journeying alongside me as my peers and colleagues. When considering the words of wisdom I wanted to leave you with, I had to come to terms with the fact that I have no words of wisdom. I could try and be poignant and memorable, but that would likely leave us all a little disappointed. It's just not my style to talk about reaching for the moon so that we land among the stars. And I don't want to just remind us to believe in ourselves when belief in our God is so much better. But there are two things I'd like to share with you that I learned from the incredible professors here. They're familiar to my fellow counseling and MFT students, but I think they have a universality that we can all appreciate. The first is this, trust the process. Loosely translated from therapist speak, this means that counseling takes time. In our instant gratification culture of Amazon Prime, we expect results right away <laughs> with the least investment possible. It's just not often that a light bulb moment occurs in the first session of therapy and a life is forever changed. More often than not, it's a series of small, sometimes imperceivable changes that over time lead to a moment of, hey, I'm different than I was when I started this. 
For us graduates, we too had to trust the process. Assignment after assignment, research paper after research paper, the degree you were working on did not come overnight. It did not come with minimal investment and a life-changing flash of realization. It came slowly. It changed you in imperceivable and small ways as you learned and grew into the person sitting here today, ready to take on the next chapter of your story. So too is our sanctification. While there are big moments like conversion, the process of becoming more like Jesus takes a lifetime. It's each calculated choice drawing us away from temptation and back into our Savior's embrace. It's little moment by little moment, faith step after faith step. We trust the process as therapists because we see the bigger picture that we are journeying with our clients. Our professors saw the bigger picture as they walked with us through our education. And God sees the story from the moment he separated light from dark, dirt into man, to when he will return and set up his kingdom in its rightful place. So trust the process. And more importantly, trust the one who is guiding you on the journey. The second therapyism I want to leave you with is famous in our department. If Dr. Berg, who looks suspiciously like a young Walter Matthau, <laughs> ever has a statue in his honor, I would advocate that this would be engraved underneath. He is widely known for answering his, ther his students' therapeutic questions with, it depends. <laughs> Dr. Berg, what mode of therapy is better to use when working with couples? It depends. How do we properly integrate theology and psychology? It depends. And he's right. In most cases, it does depend. While there are some things that are black and white, most of the world exists in shades of gray, with right and wrong being dependent on the substance of what is being compared. For a Master of Divinity student who is trying to decide on PhD opportunities, the question of which school to go to is not a moral one. So it depends. The same goes for a Christian ministry, youth ministry, or biblical studies graduate. The right choice of which church to pursue for vocational ministry depends on your calling, your family structure, and needs. Do your best to be faithful to where you feel God has called you, and then trust the process. If God wants you in Nineveh, he's, he has ways to make sure you get there on time. <laughs> now what I'm not saying is that it doesn't matter, because that is not what Dr. Berg has instilled in us. It does matter, but it may not be universal. In therapy, what works for one client with an anxiety disorder may not work for another with the same disorder from a different context. So be flexible. Be ready to change course and remember that you, as the therapist, are not the expert in their lives. They are. So journeying with them has far more to do with their story than when, where you think their story ought to go. The same goes for us today. Be ready for where God will lead you, and then trust that He is the expert and will get to you where you need to be with each small step you take in His will. So as I said, I have no words of wisdom of my own, but the ones I do leave you with, I receive from our godly guides along the way. And as simple as trust the process and it depends sounds, the eternal impact they may lead to is not in the memorable words themselves, nor the helpful professors that we learn them from. Rather, the immutable God who faithfully brings to completion all the processes he begins and generously grants wisdom for every unique soul and situation. For apart from him, we can do nothing. For apart from him, we can do nothing. So fellow graduates, where will each of us go from here? It depends. But I encourage you to trust the process of 2022. Your story is unfolding before you, and I pray each step forward is blessed as we seek to honor Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, Courtney and uh, Emily. It's my privilege to introduce three students who have distinguished themselves through uh, outstanding academic achievement. Every year, the top 7% of Briarcrest College's four-year graduates are inducted into the Association for Biblical Higher Education's Honor Society, Delta Epsilon Chi. As I introduce this year's inductees, I ask each of them to stand and remain standing. Emily Pinter, Bachelor of Arts English, Honors. Philip Gerber, 
Bachelor of Arts, Biblical Studies. Michaela Goddard, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. Let's congratulate them together. I'm going to ask you to stand again in a minute, but you can sit down. <laughs> Academic Achievement Awards are presented to the graduating student with the highest cumulative grade point average in each Bachelor of Arts degree program at Briarcrest College and Seminary. Students who receive the Academic Achievement Award must have a, a grade point average of 3.3 or higher. As I introduce this year's recipients, I again ask that each of them stand and remain standing. Once all the recipients have been acknowledged, please join me in congratulating them on their fine achievement. Katrina Bolton, Bachelor of Arts Applied Linguistics, TESOL. Tabitha Velicott, Bachelor of Arts Applied Linguistics, TESOL, after degree. Philip Gerber, Bachelor of Arts Biblical Studies. Caitlin Driscoll, Bachelor of Arts, Biblical Studies, Honors. Trey Dell, Bachelor of Arts, Business Administration, Theological. Lauren Koop, Bachelor of Arts, Christian Ministry. Rebecca Boileau, Bachelor of Arts, English. Emily Pinter, Bachelor of Arts, English, Honors. Caitlin Beale, Bachelor of Arts, General Studies. Joel Van Hattem, Bachelor of Arts, History. Riley Gitzel, Bachelor of Arts, Humanities. Liliana Wiebe, Bachelor of Arts, Music. Michaela Goddard, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology. Taylor Stanglin, Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Theological. Daniel Mandel, Bachelor of Arts, Theology. Samantha Jordan, Bachelor of Arts, Youth Ministry. Congratulations to all of you. As the, uh, as the worship team makes their way uh, down here, uh, I have an opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, each of them. They've been part of our chapel worship teams uh, over the last few years together, and uh, it is very fitting for us to be able to lead one more song in chapel uh, together as we return thanks to, uh, for what God has done and accomplished as we celebrate their achievements together. Uh, you can find the lyrics to the song that we're going to sing on page 10 of your program, so I invite you to turn there now. And uh, this song is a modern hymn that uh, we have been singing in chapel quite a bit this year. It has been, um, it has been very meaningful to me personally and to, and to us as a Briarcrest community. So it is, uh, it's a joy for us to be able to sing this together. I'm going to invite you to stand now. And uh, I think we are all plugged in and strapped on and ready to go. So take it away, Caleb. What gift of grace is Jesus my redeemer?
As the graduate and returning gentlemen, uh, please put your caps back on. Chairman Weens, it is my pleasure to present 87 college and 44 seminary graduates to receive the certificates, diplomas, and degrees as listed in your program. Each student has been approved for graduation by the faculty of Briarcrest College and Seminary. In accordance with our provincial charter, upon the recommendation of the Briarcrest College and Seminary faculty, I confer upon each graduand the appropriate credential and welcome them as Briarcrest alumni. <laughs> Now, would, would those assisting in this ceremony please take their positions to receive the individual college graduands as they're presented? And would all college graduands please stand and the first grads make their way down to the bottom of the stairs.
from the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Graduating with a certificate in arts and science, Kaylin Nicole Lowen. Graduating with a certificate in Biblical Studies, Tanner Driscoll. Corin Hannah Liskey. Faith Alyssa Liskey. Graduating with an Associate of Arts, Biblical Studies, Heidi Frey. <laughs> Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts, Biblical Studies, Jacob Lee Adams, with distinction. <laughs> Dylan Friesen, with highest distinction. Philip Jonathan Gerber, with highest distinction. <laughs> Alicia Naomi Gibson. <laughs> Landon Peter Miller. Zachary Stevens. <laughs> Joshua Christopher Tilrow. <laughs> Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Biblical Studies Honors, Caitlin Nicole Driscoll, with distinction. Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts, Christianity and Culture, Kennedy Stephanie Wood. <laughs> graduating, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts, English, Rebecca Elaine Boileau. <laughs> graduating with a Bachelor of Arts, English Honors, Emily Josephine Pinter, with highest distinction. <laughs> and now with a Bachelor of Arts General Studies, Caitlin Behiel. <laughs> Sable Jade Sampson. Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts History, Joel Nathaniel Van Hatton. <laughs> Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Humanities, Riley Ann Gitzel, with distinction. <laughs> Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Psycho Psychology, Theological, Allison Behiel. Taylor Jane Stangland. <laughs> Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Psychology, Savannah Page Bowley. <laughs> Ava Elizabeth Buchert. Emma Jane Fuloka. <laughs> Michaela Ann Goddard, with highest distinction. <laughs> Allie Victoria McMaster. <laughs> Hunter Moses Tunnell.
Jesse Ukrainitz. Tylan Jonathan Ward. Kelsey Jane Weeb. And graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Theology, Daniel Mundell. On behalf of the Faculty of Christian Ministry, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Christian Ministry, Mark Peter Bushman. William Spencer Otto Dimitro. <laughs> Ashlyn Renee Feenstra. Adam James Izzard. Lauren Ann Coop with distinction. <laughs> Graduating with a Bachelor of Arch Worship Arts, Caleb Simeon Foster. <laughs> Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Youth Ministry, Samantha Patricia Jort. Now from the Faculty of Performing Arts and Professional Studies, graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Applied Linguistics, TESOL, Katrina Emmeline Bolton, with distinction. <laughs> Jerdon Jeffrey Enns. <laughs> with a Bachelor of Arts Applied Linguistics, TESOL, after degree, Tabitha Mary Patricia Velicott, with distinction. <laughs> Graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Business Administration Theological, Trey William Dell, with distinction. <laughs> Hannah Spaulding, with distinction. With a Bachelor of Arts Business Administration, Kyle Helslot. <laughs> Landon Delwyn Rayner. <laughs> and graduating with a Bachelor of Arts Music, Liliana Emma Weeb, with distinction. Briarcrest College graduates, would you now please move your tassels from the right side to the left side of your caps? Now would the seminary graduates please stand and the first grads make their way to the bottom of the stairs and would those assisting for the seminary please take their positions to receive the individual graduates. Graduating with a Master of Christian Ministries, David Bradford. Bradford, summa cum laude. Graduating with a Master of Counseling, Marley Berg, magna cum laude. <laughs> 
Andrea Bietti, magna cum laude. Yoon Jong Joy Choi. <laughs> Tasha E. Elliott, cum laude. Marlis Faye Gibson. <laughs> Carrie Ann Harvey, magna cum laude. Desmond Donald Mudrick, magna cum laude. Robin Marie Mudrick, magna cum laude. Mary Peters, cum laude. <laughs> Shemaya Marie Rudd, magna cum laude. Joseph Paul Turner, magna cum laude. Karen Michelle Wind Vanderberg, cum laude. Graduating with a Master of Arts, Leadership and Management, Jordan Chichu, cum laude. <laughs> Amy Jo Annette Vetter, magna cum laude. Graduating with a Master of Arts, Marriage and Family Therapy, Adiola Oluwashun Adenuba, cum laude. <laughs> Melissa Charmaine Bonnell.
Colette J. Heistead, cum laude. Jennifer Jade Kerr, summa cum laude. <laughs> David King, magna cum laude. Bryce Timothy LeKelt. <laughs> Jennifer Peters. Debbie Roberts. <laughs> Michael John Vilecki. Courtney Ray Weeb, summa cum laude. <laughs> Jeremy Zacharias, cum laude. Graduating with a Master of Arts, Biblical Languages and Exegesis, Arlene Heather Stinson, cum laude. <laughs> Graduating with a Master of Divinity, Janelle Marie Armstrong, summa cum laude. Michael Albert Cluthy, magna cum laude. <laughs> Douglas James Robinson. I'd like to invite us all to unite in prayer at this time as a prayer of dedication to our graduates. Our Father, our prayer today echoes the prayer of the Apostle Paul for the Philippian believers 
whom he loved so much, in the same way that we love our graduates so very much. We thank you, God, in our every thought of our students, always with joy because of our partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. We are sure of this, that you, who began a good work in them, will bring it to completion the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for us to feel this way about them because we hold them in our hearts, for they're all partakers with us of grace in the confirmation of the gospel. For you, God, are our witness how we yearn for them with the affection of Christ Jesus. It is our prayer that their love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that they may prove what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Lord, remind them that they remain in your grip and now use them as agents of the gospel in a world that so desperately needs faith, hope, love, and truth. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Just a couple of final instructions, but first, graduates, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. The recessional will begin with the faculty. Uh, graduates, then you're going to move out into the foyer. The weather is a bit inclement, so we're going to do our, our meeting and greeting in the foyer. And uh, once the graduates have all made their way out to the foyer, we invite you, uh, the congregation, to then move out and greet them. Thank you so much for sharing this day with us. Bless you.